On the morning that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was crucified, Luke records that Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, and he said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I do not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene who was coming in from the country. And they laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This is our Lord. This is our Master. This is our Savior, the captain of our salvation, the one who has reconciled us to God, hanging on a cross. And as he is bleeding on that cross, he asks God to forgive the very people who are in the process of murdering him. This blood of the only innocent man who has ever lived is dripping from his hands and his feet. It is flowing down his sacred head. And as it does so, he blesses the people who have unjustly, who have wickedly put him there. Brothers and sisters, this is our king. This is our leader. This is our elder brother. This is the one that we are called to emulate. He's our example. He's the one who's given us the pattern whereby we are to order our lives. When we pray to be Christ-like, we should take great care to remember what Christ was like. We should remember, especially these darkest hours at the end of his life. The call to follow Christ is a call to be conformed to him. It's a call to develop the same mindset that we see in him as he walked on this earth as a real man. Today, in our ongoing study of the book of Romans, we come to one of the most challenging admonitions that we find in all the Bible as the Apostle Paul instructs us about how we are to respond to people who persecute us. Now, you'll recall in our study thus far, the first 11 chapters of Romans is filled with doctrine. Those chapters instruct us in the way of salvation that is in Christ. How to be reconciled to Christ by trusting the Lord Jesus and being forgiven of our sins as 
Christ becomes our advocate. Christ becomes our atonement. Christ becomes our life. And Paul elaborates that wonderful doctrine of salvation by grace in those first 11 chapters. But then, beginning in chapter 12, he starts drawing out applications and implications of this good news of salvation. And he does so at the very beginning of chapter 12 with the foundational application that we must never forget. Look at it in verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12, if you have your Bibles open there. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Christians are people who have been called by God to present our bodies as living sacrifices. That is, we turn over the keys of our lives to God. And in doing so, we know that we are entering into a life of transformation, a life of change. We expect to grow. And we know that this happens as our minds are increasingly renewed through the ministry of God's Spirit and His Word. And as that mind gets renewed, it is able to then understand and embrace and delight in the will of God. What this means is that the way of Christ is a way that causes people, His people, to live differently from those who do not know Him. Christ's people have different values. We have different attitudes. We have different goals, different standards. When you turn from your sin and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, your priorities change because you begin to see life the way that it really is, which means you begin to understand that you were made for something far better than this life. This life can never give to you that which your soul genuinely longs for. And so you, in Christ, begin to live for another world. That world which is to come. That world in which the Lord Jesus Christ will make everything right and will restore everything that is broken and perverted by sin. Beginning in chapter 3 of Romans 12, Paul outlines what that kind of life looks like. He tells us how we are to live now that we have been rescued by the power of God's grace and mercy. And the life that he describes, the life to which we are called by faith in him, is a life that can only be lived by the power of God's grace in us. Now, we've already looked at several specific applications in Romans chapter 12, the opening verses that are given to us as the people of God who've been saved by Jesus Christ. Today, we come to a command, an admonition, that we cannot obey apart from the supernatural working of God's Spirit deeply and powerfully in us. That admonition is found in verse 14 of Romans 12. That's our text for today. Romans 12, 14. It's found on page 900. 48 of the Bible that's provided for you. And I encourage you to look at it with me. We're just going to read this brief verse together to get the admonition before us before we begin to meditate on it. Paul writes in Romans 12, 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. What he's saying is that the way of Christ requires us to bless our persecutors, to bless our persecutors. This is what Jesus taught. It's exactly what Jesus did. Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? It's found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. And in that sermon, near the end of Matthew 5, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Jesus goes on, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Christians live by a different code from those who are not Christians. They love their friends and they hate their enemies. But as Christians, we are called to love our enemies. Christians are called to pray for our persecutors. And we do this because this is precisely what we see in our God and Father. Think with me for a moment, brothers and sisters. Do you realize that God blessed Adolf Hitler? That he blessed Vladimir Lenin? Fidel Castro? That he blessed Joseph Stalin? And Osama bin Laden? Do you realize that he blessed Margaret Sanger? That woman who began Planned Parenthood that has been responsible for one of the greatest holocausts in human history. God blessed these people. And today he continues to bless people who hate him, who curse him, who denies his very experience. How does he do this? He keeps them alive. He gives them oxygen to course through their lungs and blood to course through their veins and food. He sends his sunshine on them every morning. He sends them rain. That's the way our God and Father treats his enemies. Do you really want to be godly? Think long and hard on what your God actually is like. He loves his enemies. If we're going to bear his image well, then we're going to have to learn to love our enemies also. We're going to have to learn to bless them. Jesus teaches us that. He also demonstrates that. Do you remember the night that he was betrayed? He's there with his disciples in the garden. And religious leaders and their servants come together with those who have military authority to arrest him. You remember what Peter did whenever he saw what was going on? (laughs) He took out his sword and he tried to take off the head of Malchus. Malchus ducked and he just took off his ear. What did Jesus do? He healed that man's ear. He blessed him. Even though he was a part of the mob that was determined unjustly to arrest him and to see him executed. As we heard earlier, as I read from Luke 23, Jesus displayed this attitude even on the cross. When he stretched out there, looking at his murderers, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is the way of Jesus Christ. This way requires us to bless those who persecute us. This is the simple yet profound admonition that the Apostle Paul gives us that extends from, it arises from the mercies that we have now experienced in Jesus Christ. Bless those who persecute you. Bless. Do not curse them. Let's look at these words very simply this morning. Bless those who persecute you. I'd like to ask three questions about this portion of the admonition. First of all, what does Paul mean by persecution? What is Christian persecution? I had two experiences as a young pastor that helped me to frame my thinking as I studied the scripture about this specific question. The first experience had to do with a young man that I knew in a church I served in Dallas. He was a professional businessman. He was full of love for the Lord Jesus. He was full of zeal 
to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And Steve became burdened about a co-worker of his in his office. This man was an unbeliever. And Steve rightly felt the weight of that unbelief. And he wanted his co-worker to come to Christ. And so he realized that he needed to witness to his co-worker. And so he very intentionally began to spend hours each week trying to persuade his co-worker to come to faith in Jesus Christ. He explained the gospel to him. He pled with him. He set scripture before him. Well, one day his boss came to him and said, Steve, quit trying to push your religion on my time. Well, Steve took this as an affront to the Lordship of Christ. Because Christ had called him to make disciples. Christ had called him to be a witness. And so he refused to quit witnessing hours each week to his co-worker. And his boss finally fired him. Steve came to me and told him, told me that his boss had persecuted him because he was a Christian. The other experience is one that I had in China with a Chinese pastor a man that you may have heard of by the name of Samuel Lamb, who spent 20 years in a communist prison. He suffered as a preacher of the gospel because he refused to quit preaching the gospel from all the scripture. And so the communists put him in jail, hard labor, much, many beatings, many difficulties, saw family die while he was in prison, all because he refused to quit preaching. Well, I met Pastor Lamb at a service that was held in his house as an underground church uh, effort. We spent two hours in very cramped conditions in worship. And there in Guangzhou, afterwards in that city, we had the privilege. There were about 10 American pastors that had the privilege of sitting with him for hours and just talking to him and asking him questions. And I'll never forget the answer that he gave to one question we asked about the way he envisioned persecution And the advance of the gospel. This is what he said. In America, the church has experienced prosperity and is growing weaker. In China, the church has experienced persecution and is growing stronger. Persecution is much better than prosperity. Well, both of those experiences, one with Steve and one with Pastor Lamb, have helped frame my thinking about Two important questions regarding what constitutes Christian persecution. Steve's comments to me raise the question, can Christians claim to be persecuted any time they're treated harshly or mistreated? And Pastor Lamb's experience caused me to ask, is persecution limited to severe actions like imprisonment or the infliction of physical pain? You see, Steve saw himself as a martyr because he was fired, having tried to witness to his co-worker. But from my vantage point, Steve was not fired because of his faith. Steve was fired because he failed to put in a full day's work for a full day's pay. Steve was not living responsible before his employer, even though he had been warned Though talking about Christ is a right and good thing to do, doing so at the expense of your employer is a bad thing. See, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Steve stole time from his employer, and he suffered the consequences of thievery. He didn't lose his job for the sake of righteousness or for doing good, but he lost his job for doing evil. Brothers and sisters, if the reason you experience opposition is due to anything other than your identity with and devotion to Jesus Christ, then what happens to you is not Christian persecution. This is why the Apostle Peter specifically forbids Christians from thinking that all suffering that comes into our lives is necessarily Christian persecution. In 1 Peter 4.15 he says... Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a meddler. When Christians suffer for doing what God forbids, then they are not 
experiencing Christian persecution. And they must not twist Scripture in attempt to comfort themselves with the promises, promises and encouragements that are designed for those who suffer because of their faith in Christ. Now, Pastor Lamb spoke in generalities when he described China as being persecuted and America as being prosperous. And in many ways, that generalization is warranted. It's right. We think of the persecuted church. We pray for the persecuted church. And there are vast differences between being a Christian in China and a Christian in America. Our experiences are significantly different. However, we should not think that persecution against Christians because they're Christians, only exists where there's systematic or official, harsh, or even violent opposition for their faith. We must be careful not to limit our understanding of the nature of persecution to those obvious and extreme situations. The beheadings, the mutilations, the stonings, the imprisonments, that are regularly carried out against Christians in other places of the world today, simply because they are Christians, are examples of severe Christian persecution. But the Bible does not limit its definition of persecution to certain levels of severity. It's not just violent acts that constitute persecution. Lesser forms of opposition to followers of Christ are also included. Listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. In this saying, Jesus gives us three categories of persecution. The first and the third are verbal. They're verbal. It's words. The second one includes both verbal and physical opposition, and Christian persecution encompasses all of them. When a believer is spoken of derisively or abusively because of his devotion to Christ, he is at that point experiencing persecution for Christ's sake. Now, granted, it's not as severe as the violence that's carried out against those who are made to suffer physically because of their faith. But it is nonetheless real. The same is true for slanderous accusations that are made about believers because of their devotion to Christ. When we experience such things, how should we respond? Well, Jesus tells us how to respond. He says in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, we are to rejoice and be glad. For two reasons. First, because our reward will be great in heaven. And secondly, because in the same way they persecuted the prophets who've gone before us. So we find ourselves in that godly train of faithful servants of Christ throughout history. In Luke's parallel passage, in Luke 6, verses 22 and 23, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Again, he invokes the experience, the memory of the prophets who lived long before. But with this language, we see Jesus expands the idea of persecution to include even attitudes of hatred. So Christian persecution can include a wide variety of responses to believers. Everything from scorn, ridicule, hatred, physical violence, imprisonment, and death. But for such opposition, no matter how mild or how severe it might be, for such opposition to be regarded as persecution in the biblical sense, it must be provoked because of identity with and devotion to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Now, this helps make sense of what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12 when he says, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Have you ever found yourself looking at that verse and thinking, well, nobody's thrown me in jail. Nobody's stoned me. Nobody's cut off my arm for Christ's sake. How does this apply to me? Well, it applies to you in a variety of possible ways. 
Maybe you've been scorned. Maybe you've been reviled. Maybe you've been hated because of your devotion to Christ. Well, that is a part also of persecution in the biblical sense. In Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, Jesus utters this promise to us. There's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Every Christian should expect, as we faithfully follow Christ, to experience some form of persecution. Not all in the same way, but all for the same reason. Because we refuse to compromise our devotion to Christ as Lord. Our Lord and Savior was opposed. He was hated. Animosity came against Him that led to His crucifixion. And those who follow Christ must realize that by identifying with Jesus, we are inviting into our lives the very same opposition that he himself endured. In John 15, 18, he said, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Followers of a crucified, persecuted master will themselves be persecuted. When we intentionally live according to the way of Christ, we can count on meeting opposition from those who hate Christ and who hate the way of Christ. Whether that opposition comes in severe forms of violence, imprisonment, loss of life, or comparatively benign forms, like being graded down on a paper that you turn in, or being removed from a sports team, or passed over for a job opportunity or mocked by family and friends or ridiculed. If it is provoked by submission to Christ and obedience to his commandments, it's Christian opposition. It's Christian persecution. So we must not call every affliction that comes into a Christian's life persecution. That designation must be reserved for opposition that arises because of devotion to Christ. But neither should we dismiss any opposition that comes out of devotion to Christ simply because it's not severe doesn't result in the shedding of blood. So here's our definition. Christian persecution is any opposition you experience due to your identity with or devotion to Jesus Christ as Lord. Well, let's consider a second question. Who are our persecutors? Well, obviously, those who directly come against the people of God because we are devoted to Jesus Christ. Saul of Tarsus, before the Lord saved him and turned him into the Apostle Paul, is a classic example. Do you remember in Philippians 3 when Paul is giving something of his own biography? He describes himself as a person as to zeal, having been a persecutor of the church. And when you read in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9, you see the Apostle Paul participating in trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. But it's not just those who are openly coming against Christians because they hate Christianity. But there's a more subtle kind of persecution that can come to Christians. It comes by the hand of those who think that they're actually serving God in what they do. In John chapter 16, verse 2, Jesus told his disciples, Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. Some of the harshest persecution that has come to God's people throughout history has been at the hands of those who've named the name of Christ. John Bunyan was arrested in 1660 and was kept in Bedford County Jail for 12 years at the hands of Anglican Christian authorities. We've seen it here in the colonies of these United States. In 1651, the Baptist Obadiah Holmes was arrested. He was brutally beaten outside the Walls are outside the city of Boston in Massachusetts by the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. 
So our persecutors include anyone who would oppose and punish us because of our identity with or devotion to Jesus Christ. Well, that leads us to the third question. What does it mean to bless those who persecute us? What's involved in this admonition? What must we do? Well, the word Paul uses here, bless, is the word we get eulogy from. And it quite simply means to speak good words about, to say good things about, to speak well of them. Paul, you notice, says it twice. Bless those who persecute you. Bless. Do not curse them. As I've already pointed out in Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. What are we to pray regarding our persecutors? We're to pray for their blessing. We're to pray for God to do good to them. What's the greatest good that God can do to anyone? Well, the greatest good God can do to anyone is to bring them into a right relationship with himself. It's to open their eyes. To show them the truth that is in Jesus Christ. To save them from their sin. To pour out his grace and mercy on them. So that they are reconciled to their creator against whom they have rebelled. That's the greatest good. That's what we should pray. William Tyndale, the father of the modern English Bible and the English Reformation was betrayed by a friend as he had translated the scriptures into the English language in the 16th century. That betrayal led to his arrest by Roman Catholics. And then in October, on October 6, 1536, he was choked to death by a chain and his body was lashed to a stake and was burned at the stake. But before the chain took his last breath, He screamed out these words, O Lord, open the king of England's eyes. He was blessing those who were persecuting him. Brothers and sisters, this is the way of Christ. This is what is required of us if we're going to be followers of the way. It's not hard to understand. It's just exceedingly difficult to do. That's the positive command. But Paul adds to it a negative aspect to make sure that we don't misunderstand what's being required of us. Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse them. And this idea of cursing governs both our actions as well as our attitudes. In essence, he's saying stop cursing them. And isn't that your natural reaction? I mean, isn't that... True, just no matter what the cause of opposition that comes against you, is it your response naturally to strike back and to put them in their place, to see harm come to them? Paul says, no, we must not do that. He's not here talking about invoking curse words, but rather calling down curses upon those who are doing us harm. Seeking their harm. Wanting their harm. Not just in our actions, but our attitudes. We're not to wish ill of them. We're not to hope for their destruction. Do you remember when Jesus was setting his face toward Jerusalem and he sent some disciples ahead of him to go to a certain Samaritan city and to make a way for him to head all the way to Jerusalem? And so James and John go and they come to this city of Samaria And the people there don't want anything to do with with Jesus. And they won't let him go through. You remember what James and John did? They go back to Jesus and they said, Lord, this town won't let us through. Do you want us to just call down fire from heaven and just consume them? That's that's natural. I get that, you know. I mean, I read that and I think, well, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's what I'd do. You remember what Jesus did? He rebuked them. He rebuked them. He said, that's not the right spirit. And they went to a different village. Proverbs 24 verse 17 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. The way of Christ is a way that requires blessing for those who persecute us. This is radical. It's countercultural. 
It's contrary to the way that we naturally think and ache and, and act. The New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner says this about this verse. He says, this injunction to bless those who persecute us is one of the most revolutionary statements in the New Testament and can be carried out only by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's true. But it's also one of the most powerful displays of the truth and the power of the gospel. Whenever, by God's grace, we're able to bless those who persecute us. When Christians live this way, we testify to something that is unseen. We demonstrate that there's something more important, more real than ease, than painlessness, than loss. More important than life itself. This is the way of Christ. Well, how can we do this? Brothers and sisters, how are we to look at this simple, clear, profound admonition and say, okay, I'm going to commit myself to live this way? How can we develop the kind of mindset that responds to our persecutors like this? Well, let me offer some suggestions that arise from the Word of God itself. First, remember that all that you are and all that you have is due to God's grace. You remember the question that Paul asked the Corinthian church? What do you have that you haven't received? What's the answer to that question? Nothing. Nothing. Really? It's true. If that's true, then we ought to be remembering that all that we are, all that we have has come to us by God's grace. As such, we deserve none of the blessings of life that we take for granted. If God gave us what we deserve in our sin, then we would have no other prospect than to spend eternity in hell paying for our sin against this good gracious God. All of life is grace. We must learn this. Remind each other of this, that life is grace. Secondly, remember that your persecutors are just like you would be if it were not for God's grace poured out upon you. I mean, what makes us different than our persecutors? We would be just like them. In fact, We were just like them, maybe not doing everything they do, before God came and saved us. Do you remember what the Bible calls us before we were reconciled to God? Paul's written it in Romans 5.10. It was while we were enemies that we were reconciled to God. Brothers and sisters, let us never forget the fact that we weren't born into God's good graces. We were born rebels and enemies. And God, at great cost, through the life and death of His Son, came to us while we were His enemies and reconciled us to Himself. He turned us into His friends. What keeps you from being a persecutor rather than the persecuted? Matthew Henry tells a story, the great Bible commentary, tells a story of traveling one time and on his trip, he was robbed. And so that night, he, he writes, into, writes in his diary a, a recollection of the account. And this is what he writes by way of a prayer to God. I thank thee first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. And fourth, Because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. It's by the mercy of God that we are what we are. What a mercy to be numbered among those who are persecuted rather than those who are persecuting. A third suggestion. We must remember. We must never forget. Our master was crucified. We serve a crucified king. He laid down his life in order to rescue sinners like us. He endured opposition against himself. He endured scorn and reviling 
and abuse for the sake of the honor and glory of his father and the salvation of his people. Jesus says in John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Brothers and sisters, when we don't revile in return, when we bless those who persecute, we are commending the gospel of our crucified Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is exactly what the Apostle Peter refers to in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, where he writes, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. You just stop for a moment. If somebody makes you suffer for righteousness sake, do you see what's going on? They're actually putting you in the pathway of blessing. That's another dimension to think about. But Peter says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them or be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Could it be that nobody's asking us for the reason of the hope that is within us because we're not living as if we have great hope within us? People oppose us, things go wrong, and it's as if all we can see is right here, right now. And we lose sight of these eternal truths, these realities. But Peter says, no, when, when we live this way, when we do what we're admonished to do, bless those who persecute us. We open up lots of opportunities for questions. Where does that come from? How do you have that mentality? And that provides opportunity for us to commend the way of Jesus Christ. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. He did that by enduring God's curse against people who have violated his law. He did that by taking our place. So we read in John Chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. This is the way of Christ. It's the way that he calls us to live as well. Now, if you can't imagine living like this, I get it. I get it. It's not automatic. It's not easy. It requires the Spirit of God working in us. It requires us just going deeper into the grace of God and and having our minds renewed daily by His Word so that we can think like this. There's no way we'll be able to obey this were it not for the mercies of God in Jesus Christ. So we must trust Christ. Depend upon Christ. Think rightly about Him. All that He's done for poor lost sinners like you and me. If you've never believed in Him before, believe in Him now. Trust Him. Trust this Lord, this one who gave up His life to save sinners like us so that we can live in a way that this world simply cannot comprehend. As you enter into a life of faith in Christ, you enter into a life of being transformed by His grace, having your mind renewed by His word, So that you can, indeed, by the strength that he gives, bless those who persecute you. Do not curse, but bless them. Because this is the way of our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these admonitions. We we look at them and we shrink back. From them because they seem impossible to us, and indeed they are by our own strength. And yet, when we look to Christ and we see what He's done, how He's lived, and we believe in Your Spirit, we take Your Word seriously, we desire to commit ourselves to it. Help us to repent of that kind of self protective, self promoting attitude that always wants to strike back. that takes secret delight when our tormentors have difficulties and trials in this world. But show us the way of Christ. Empower us to live in it. 
to bless those who oppose us for his sake. We pray in his name. Amen.